Well, before we get started on part two of the tank tour, I want to mention two things. First, I want to give a shout out to Rick Springer. Thank you, Rick, for reaching out to me through email and sharing the story behind your tank. It was very inspiring. I enjoyed hearing from you. The second thing I want to mention is that Plant Life Project now has an Amazon storefront. Now, this is a collection of products that I use personally that I talk about on this channel and I recommend because they have been helpful. As we all know, the aquarium hobby is cluttered with a lot of unnecessary products. So I'm hoping this will be a resource to help save you time and money, get you straight to the products that are going to help you succeed. And this is going to be an evolving list that I hope will include plants as well. Amazon has a growing selection of house plants and I've actually got plants in the mail right now coming from different sellers on Amazon. I want to test the quality of the shipping. I want to test the health and quality of the plants. And if they're up to par, I'm going to start adding them to the storefront. So this could really be a valuable resource for you. A one-stop shop for helpful products and plants that I show you how to grow on this channel. This is something I never had when I first got started in this hobby. I had to glean information from a number of different sources and it's out there but there's nothing consolidated to really save you time and money and guide you in the right direction. So I'm hoping that this will be that resource that I never had. And you have input into the selection of products on the store. If there's something that you don't see at the store you think I should start adding, then let me know in the comment section of this video. I'll test it out, I'll review it, and if it's up to standard, I'll put it on the store. And likewise, if enough of you are saying, hey, this one product over here, it's crap, it's not helpful, we don't think it should be on the store, I'll go back and review it, and if it turns out to be problematic, I will remove it. I do earn a commission from the products being sold on the storefront, so this is a way for you to get what you need and also help support the channel and enable me to continue providing content for you. Well, now let's get back to part two of our tank tour. Well, here we are in my son's room, and this is the beginner house planted tank. The video that I did close to two years ago now, and did a series actually of the story of this tank. Now, some good things that have been going on with this tank are the peace lily, first and foremost. It's starting to bloom, as you can see, and it has grown significantly since uh, adding both of these lights, as well as the parlor palm. It's continuing to send out new fronds, and it's just really been incredible to see these plants uh, you know, maintain their growth and continue to grow over these last few years, because there's always the question of you know, how long will these plants actually last growing in the water? Neon Pothos has been doing well. This is actually a, a cutting that I took. Um, the original Pothos, the, the original cutting that I put in is, was over on the left side and it was beginning to trail down in front of the tank. So I took a cutting and, and placed it on this other side. And uh, it hasn't been growing as quickly as the Peace Lily in the parlor palm, but it's also not getting quite the amount of light just because of the distance. Uh, between the lights and the actual plants. So one hack that I'm not sure I've ever mentioned on my videos that you can do with these regular household LED light bulbs, you can remove the globe part of the bulb, which is pretty much a light diffuser, and it keeps the light from being quite so intense. So uh, that really, you know, it intensifies the, the brightness of the light, as you can see. I've never set up a test to see whether you get actually get more plant growth from a globeless LED bulb as com you know as uh, compared to one with a globe but i got this idea from someone I, i'm sorry i can't remember who it was someone commented on one of my videos and, and told me about this trick and i tried it out and uh, you know it seems to work pretty well you can see the peace lily roots just really starting to fill up the tank and even below the, the substrate in, into the soil, you can see all those roots that are filling up the bottom of the tank. Now, one thing I didn't show you in a previous video of the, the 10 gallon neon tetra tank, when I took it apart, the peace lily that I had in there, the roots were completely filling the bottom of the tank. Like I could almost lift the entire soil layer in one big piece because all those roots were just so 
intertwined and and you know matted together and i think that's a really cool thing because that shows that the roots were getting nutrients that they needed but they were also not getting smothered down in the substrate now the the struggle i've been having with this tank and i mentioned it in a previous video is the the brown algae it's just really been a headache and um i did have some other submerged plants in here some guppy grass at one point some frog bit and uh, they just never did very well i think it was an issue of light i'm not keeping this light on this is just a, a light i turn on for display purposes um, and the nitrate levels of course have been very low and so it's not because of the nitrate levels i'm i'm thinking there's something else in the tap water it could be a lot of silica build up in the tap water i'm also having this issue in a uh, jar and two jars that i have cuttings in right now and they're sitting in the windowsill but th they have tap water in them so that's why I'm, th I'm starting to think that i may have an issue with my tap water and there does seem to be a pattern that in the tanks that i'm using tap water or mostly tap water i'm getting more of an algae issue it's not always brown algae sometimes it's black beard algae or, or others uh, but the tanks that I've used distilled water in are mostly distilled. I'm just not having that as much of an issue. So um, I'm really anxious to get started on using RO water. I need to get an RO filter. Uh, so if there's any recommendations you guys have, uh, please let me know. Because uh, there's, there's so much of a selection out there and it's hard to know which one to go with. Um, aside from that, unfortunately the fish in here have passed away. Now the guppies, you know, two years is usually what I get out of guppies anyway. But my son's betta, um, I'm not sure if he just wasn't being fed enough or maybe too much. You know, I have not been as attentive to this tank as I should have been. This is, you know, it's, it's away from all my other tanks. It's in my son's room and um, the lights get turned on, but that's usually about all I do. And um, so part of that is helpful information because you want to see, okay, what, what is the threshold for these tanks? Like, you know, what, how much neglect can they take? But also how attentive do I need to be? And so that it's helpful information to know, you know, what that limit is. And, uh, but at the same time, I don't like to neglect my tanks. I want to take care of them. And um, I think I could do that better if this tank was was out with you know closer to my other ones. I temporarily have this this hob filter on this tank because mostly because of the brown algae problem. I actually did scrape the uh, the glass the other day, and um, you know I, I'm not I'm not a big fan of gravel vacuuming, so I just as I was scraping it, I was running the hob filter. It's been collecting all the free floating pieces of algae in there but one thing to learn from this setup is how crowded parlor palms can get you know this is actually about half of what was originally in here over the past almost two years now i have been thinning them out but they get to a point where they get so well rooted and especially the roots going down to the substrate that they get to a point where it's just more difficult to pull them out so at some point i just stopped doing that so I think uh, when I use the parlor palm in the future, I am not going to plant it so close together. It looks great when you first put it in. It looks great now too, but I also want to give the plants the appropriate amount of space they need to grow and be healthy. An interesting thing to note, when I was in here the other day scraping the brown algae off the glass, there were a lot of ladybugs in the water and upon closer inspection i did see a few that were hanging out in the parlor palms and um, you know this is the time of year that we do get ladybugs coming into the house one way or another and so it's kind of not surprising but at the same time I, it did concern me when i found i think it was six total and there may be more in there that i just didn't see toward the back but yeah six ladybugs at varying stages of decomposition in there and so the, the, what, what comes to my mind is, did, that, did the toxins from the ladybugs have anything to do with the fish health in here? So, and I'm just not sure. I haven't done a whole lot of research on it, but 
Um, the only thing I've been able to find so far, just on a web search, is a few uh, a few similar questions being posed in forums, and without any real clear answer. So uh, I don't know if you guys have any input on that subject, but that is something I'm interested in. And it's interesting that on this side of the tank, I'm seeing some some of the pothos roots growing down uh, into the substrate, but I'm not seeing them on the lowest level in, in that dirt layer. They could be down there and they're just not up against the glass, but it's just interesting. It's just an observation that uh, on the other side, the peace lily roots are just all over the place in the dirt layer, but not so much uh, on the other side with the pothos. So we might as well take in the really cool uh, Hot Wheels collection in my in my son's on my son's display cabinet here. Uh, oh, a Lamborghini! That's really cool. A couple of Lamborghinis, or maybe that's a Ferrari back there. Anyway, the joys of being nine years old. Sometimes I wish I was there again. No, it's not a Ferrari. It's a Corvette. That's what it is. Wow, those Corvettes are really coming along. But as far as the future of this tank, um, I, I would like to keep it going because I really want to see how long these plants can, can grow and be healthy. Um, but I do want to solve this brown algae issue because it's been bugging me for over a year now. And uh, so I think the next step is to, to get the RO filter and you know see if, if that makes a difference. See if there's silicate built up in the water or if it's just coming from the sand, or you know, it could be phosphates. I haven't tested specifically for phosphates, but I would just have a hard time believing that there would be much of any phosphate with with the plants growing. But that you know, I need to test to be sure. And another thing to note is that there have not been really any scavengers in this tank. I, I don't have snails in it. I don't have you know shrimp or anything. Uh, or any any algae eating fish so you know th that that plays a role as well if there's no cleanup crew then there's going to be more uh, accumulation of debris that is you know is not breaking down at a sufficient rate and that's that can contribute to algae problems too so in the future i may try to turn this into a shrimp tank i may try to you know have some other uh, invertebrate some snails in there and you know we'll see if that makes a difference so there's there's definitely more to learn from this one tank and I'm you know I'm still I'm looking forward to trying some new things and looking forward to what the future holds what lessons can be learned let's take a look at the 75 gallon and talk about it so this tank is currently kind of in limbo it's between projects if you remember a few weeks ago, uh, the video where I pruned, put the pothos in here, cut it back severely, and of course it's beginning to grow back. Uh, that's when I took this, you know, the whole setup down, the whole riparian plant setup down, took everything out. And my plan was, at the time, was to try to grow the giant peace lilies. And it kind of backfired on me. So I prepped the, the plants, they were already large, they were already full sized. I prepped them and got them in the tank and they were you know, transitioning for several weeks and I thought they were doing okay. But then uh, one day I, I noticed they were starting to rot close to the base. And so I ended up taking all the large ones out and I still have some small ones. These, these uh, small peace lilies are some of the, the lar that larger variety that I wanted to grow. I mean, the, the large ones that I had in here were almost up to the light and they were, they were just big and beautiful um, unfortunately that didn't work out so you know these small ones eventually will grow large but it may take some time because they're 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 slowly growing they're putting out new leaves but it's just going to take time so I think I'm going to switch gears I'm going to pivot and and attempt another project um, one thought with this next project was to grow mostly vining plants and I've already got that started, of course, with two different varieties of pothos. But I also added a Marble Queen pothos in here and then a Baltic Blue, which kind of has a split leaf and it's really cool. Um, and I wanted to grow, try to grow that up on the, the trellis here. And I may try to modify the trellis. Uh, I'm also trying some Louisiana Iris 
which is a bog plant and uh, for some reason have never attempted it in a riparium and it's a, an ideal plant as long as it gets enough light so that's kind of the struggle I'm having uh, may not be getting enough light but they are growing this you know they, they both have doubled in size since putting them in here a few weeks ago so I recently got these planters that I want to experiment with and um, I'm thinking this may be a good opportunity to use this tank and just take out some of what's here and, and implement these planters and test them out with various house plants. And um, so this hob filter, if you recall, I made a few videos of this tank being a no filter uh, tank. And I kept it that way for several months. But the problem I kept having was the buildup of mulm on the, the, the substrate. And it got to the point where it was just ridiculous. The, the water was getting cloudy anytime I reached in there to do anything. And anytime the fish swam too close to the bottom, it would stir up the mulm and the water would get cloudy. So I got tired of the cloudy water. And even though the water parameters were staying at the appropriate levels, the nitrates were very low. There was no buildup of ammonia. There was no, you know, everything was, was doing okay as far as the water chemistry. But um, that, all that mulm just kind of bothered me. So I ended up putting the hob filter back on and it, um, it produced enough current to stir it up and over time remove that mulm. And so now there's hardly any mulm at all in the bottom, which is the way I want it. I don't mind some debris being down there. I mean, this, I do want this to be a natural tank and there's going to be debris. Uh, but it, you know, it's, it's, it's much cleaner than it was you know before I added the hob filter so um, but I don't run this filter all the time it doesn't run at night and you know like yesterday I, I never plugged it in today I might so it, you know it's not um, it's not on all the time and you know it's large enough that you know I could use it as a planter for these riparian plants but the only problem is I'm actually trying to use it to filter out the water so I've got polyester floss in there that I clean out from time to time. And I'm actually, you know, I want it to mechanically filter all of that uh, excessive debris. So the, so the downside is uh, if I'm using it for that, I can't really use it as a planter effectively. And it takes up so much space in the back. So I'm actually thinking about removing it again for the time being so I can utilize that area for riparian plants. And... Um, I mean, you know, a thought that I had was I could try to modify the lids on the sides here, you know, to fit the uh, the hob filter on the side. But then there's the issue of the light. So anyway, I, I don't know. I'm still trying to figure that out, and I'll, I'll come to a conclusion at some point. But um, I definitely don't want to give up that much space in the back if I don't have to. So I'm willing to take this off again and and try it as a complete no filter setup. So that's what's going on with the repairing plants. I'm going to turn this off for a minute so we can kind of reduce the glare, hopefully, and we'll talk about what's going on uh, in the tank. So, uh, yeah, I, all the plants are just lush and beautiful. All the fish seem to be really happy. Every morning, this tank, you know, slowly turns on, the light slowly turns on, and it's, you know, it simulates a sunrise, and you can see the fish starting to get active and stir around, and... Uh, and of course, this is my bedroom, so I, I'm, you know, I'm sitting on my bed right now, so I get to wake up, and that's the first thing I see. So that's a lot of fun. Um, I've thinned out the Italian Val in this tank a number of times. You know, it just it goes wild, it gets crazy, and which I'm okay with. Uh, you know, you know, I want this to be a natural tank. I like the jungle style, you know, setup, and you know, I want the plants to do their thing. Um, but from time to time, I have thinned out some of the jung of the uh, Italian Val. The Amazon sword has actually put off some plantlets a few different times. There's one stem coming up. There's a plantlet here. I actually broke one off and stuck it in the substrate in the back. And then, uh, can't really see it, but there's, well, here we go. There's another stem coming off, and uh, it's starting to root into the substrate. The plantlet is starting to root into the substrate. So, um, yeah, I like to see that. I mean, I like to see my plants reproducing, and I want them to do their thing. I'm not trying to really control anything too tightly other than keeping the Italian Val under control. <coughs> but 
but yeah, all the fish just really seem to be happy. So I started out with five of the black skirt tetras, and uh, I actually ended up with two more. These reproduced, but it's kind of funny. It, you know, several months ago when I removed all the riparian plants, I moved them out to my greenhouse into a 55-gallon tank, and little did I know that these black skirt tetras had laid eggs on the plant roots. And so after several weeks, uh, I noticed in the 55 gallon out, out in the greenhouse, oh, there's a couple of fish in there. How'd those get in there? And I realized, oh, those are black skirt tetras. So that, that must have been what happened. So I, I grew them up over the summer and then moved them back in here. So now I've got seven. I still have five uh, peppered quarries. Got one rainbow shark you can see there. And I had four or five guppies. Now I'm down to one. They have, they've aged out, and this, I'm surprised this one's still hanging on. She's, she's got to be two years old, which is usually what usually the lifespan I get from guppies. Um, and then there's four out of Synclus in here, and they blend in pretty well, but I do see them from time to time all together. And, um, and so, yeah, this rock, I'm actually letting it get covered with algae just to make sure there's kind of, a, you know, a, a, a good spot where the autosynclus can can feed because from time to time I do clean the glass off and a lot of algae gets scraped off the, the sides of the glass especially and um, so yeah they, they're doing well that's that's their that's all they eat in here I don't feed them any algae wafers they're just eating the algae that is naturally occurring in this tank all right now I'm going to give you a sneak peek at my next project that I've got so this is, <clears throat> is a riparium that I built using only cat safe plants, non toxic house plants. And it's been up for several weeks. Uh, plants are, are growing wonderfully. And I've actually made the video of this build uh, and it will be posted on YouTube. Um, I think December 24th is what I have it scheduled for. So you'll see the uh, start to finish build process. And I've got to tell you, I'm proud of myself. Um, I can't, I'm not going to spoil it for you, but <laughs> I'm proud of myself for this lid. I came up with another, you know, really, really fun, creative lid. And, um, you know, it presented its own challenges. Can't wait for you to see how I put this lid together and secure these plants. That'll be a lot of fun. But as far as water changes on this tank, I've been only changing the water once every three months. And, um, you know, during that time, the tannins build up pretty heavily in this tank. And uh, I, don't, I don't really want this to be a black water tank because, you know, it's so big and I really want to be able to see clearly through it. The fish that I have in here are not brightly colored. So um, trying to keep it away from being a black water tank. So, yeah, the tannins build up and I do, you know, probably 40 to 50 percent water change once every three months and that's worked out pretty well so an interesting thing after i took out all these plants there was nothing in here for a little while as far as the riparian plants only the pothos on the sides so once i did that the frog bit just exploded and of course this uh, this is after i've thinned it out i've thinned it out a few times i mean this i'll, I'll throw a picture on here but um, the top was completely covered with frog bit and you know that's it that was so that frog bit was occupying the niche that was opened up once the riparian plants were removed so there's nothing there was nothing uh, in the back taking out all that excess nutrients in the water column and so the frog bit jumped in and took advantage of that situation it's interesting to me that the the black skirt tetras they will They'll start to feed on the frog bit roots after I thin out the Italian vow. And I'm not really sure why, except that maybe they just don't have the room physically to, uh, to feed on the roots when the, the vowel is in there. And once I remove a lot of this vowel, it opens it up, makes those roots more vulnerable. Maybe I can't figure that out. But uh, as far as feeding goes, I mean, I'm feeding probably every other day. And I feed a good bit. I feed um, fluval bug bites, and then I drop in uh, several uh, sinking wafers for the, the bottom feeders. And 
that's really all I do. Everybody seems to be staying healthy and pretty active, and of course they're waiting on me to feed them right now. So this is the view that I get to see every morning when I wake up. The light is just turned on and fish are starting, starting to get active and uh, it's just a very relaxing way to wake up. Uh, so there's a story behind this tank. I call this my depression tank uh, because a few years ago I you know, went through severe depression and it started off as uh, chronic fatigue. I couldn't get out of bed one morning, just was too tired to do anything. And that lasted for several weeks. Like I could, I could barely get out of bed. I, I was spending so much time sleeping. And um, anyway, I just thought it was, uh, just thought it was chronic fatigue. I, I knew I was burned out, and uh, had had some plans that I had been working on very hard that failed, and that eventually led to just my, my guess, my mind shutting down, emotions shutting down. So anyway. Um, uh, I, you know, thankfully, as I was beginning to recover with some help, I, um, I thought, you know, I, I have all these, I have these riparium tanks out in the family room, but there's nothing in my bedroom. And if this happens again, where I, you know, can barely function, I need something beautiful to look at, and um, I need a tank in my bedroom. So, uh, my wife thankfully agreed for me to have a, a tank in the bedroom, and so. Um, and so I set this tank up, and thankfully I haven't haven't got I haven't been back to that that you know deep depression um, the way that it happened then. Uh, but it has been a wonderful thing to to bring this little slice of nature into the bedroom, um, just to view, just to see every morning when I wake up, um, see the watch the fish feed. So all the smaller tanks that I've had that I've made videos on, most of them I've taken down. And I, that's because I just don't have the room to put all the different tanks that I want. And so I, I have most of them that I, I cycle through. I, I build them, I try to leave them up for at least a year, and then I change them out. You know, I've just got, I've just got more ideas I want to try out, not enough space. And so, um, and so this, is, this is all the tanks I have right now. But um, I'm hoping that I can get some studio space soon. Uh, I'm attempting to clean out my garage and hopefully we'll convert it into studio space. And, you know, I want to have room to set up these tanks long term and to see, you know, to, to see how they uh, grow and develop, to document that through video and to share it with y'all. And I just, you know, I can do that to some extent with the tanks I have, but I really want to have more space. So we'll see how that goes. I'm in the process now of cleaning out the garage, trying to get rid of excess things. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's a chore, that's for sure. So I'll keep you updated on that. We'll see how it goes. Now, if you haven't checked out part one of this tank tour, I'll be sure to link that in this video. And uh, be sure to keep an eye out for the Cat Safe Riparium build, which should be coming out on the 24th of December, uh, 2022. So uh, I'll put the link and for that one as well once it comes out well thank you guys for joining me on this tank tour hope you enjoyed it and i will see you in the next video